In 1999, Ann Landers, a writer for the Chicago Times, printed an article entitled Positively Negative. This article addressed the deceptive nature of alcohol. Let me read what was published. We drank for joy and became miserable. We drank to get along and got into an argument. We drank for friendship and made them enemies. We drank for sleep and woke up exhausted. We drank to get high and ended up depressed. We drank to feel better and ended up sick. We drank to calm ourselves down, but ended up with the shakes. We drank for confidence and became afraid. We drank to make conversation easier, and the words came out slurred. We drank to diminish our problems, but instead saw them multiply. We drank to feel heavenly, but ended up feeling like hell. We drank to cope with life, and instead invited death. Alcohol is perhaps the most deceptive and destructive drink in the entire world. According to the World Health Organization, alcohol contributes to over 3 million deaths each year. It is a leading risk for death and disability among those ages 15 to 49, accounting for 10% of all deaths in this age group. We know from medical science and research that alcohol is very damaging to the body. There is a long list of health problems and concerns that come through the consumption of alcohol. It destroys the liver. It affects the bladder. It has problems associated with the kidneys. There are multiple cancers that are connected with alcohol. It creates heart disease. And even this, doesn't matter how much you drink, it does permanent brain damage. It destroys the cells in our mind. The National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism has reported that 26% of drinkers, those who would drink from the range of heavy drinkers down to what many people call social drinkers, that out of all those who drink alcohol, 26% binge drink at least once a month. Binge drinking is anything where the blood alcohol level is above 0.14. It is about double the legal limit in most countries around the world. It is drinking to the point where someone would black out. They would not even remember what they did, what they said, where they were. They would be in an alcoholic trance or completely passed out. Some have likened it to that of a mini coma where they're alive, they're awake, but yet they're not alert to what's going on. And I think you understand this, that someone that would drink that heavy to black out or be in that state would damage their body even further and at a rapid rate. All of the things that I mentioned earlier increase drastically the more alcohol that is consumed and the more alcohol is consumed. This is a very destructive drink for our body. But not only is alcohol destructive to your health, but think about the effects that it has in our society. Alcohol has devastated our society in many different ways. We think about what goes on in the home, the breakdown of the home and the contribution that alcohol or alcoholism has upon the family unit. There is more abuse when someone is under the influence of alcohol. The verbal abuse, the physical abuse, even sexual abuse increases 
when someone is consuming alcohol. And possibly you know people today that are going through problems in their home or have a broken home because of alcohol that has been there. I know many people today that divorce has happened because of one of the partner or even both of the partners not being able to control their alcohol consumption. I know many young people that have grown up in homes where dad or mom were alcoholics and they were abusive. They wasted their finances. They were never around. Their life centered around the bottle. It has been very destructive upon our homes. But then you also think about how it's affected our society in the sense of disorderly conduct and criminal behavior. A survey was done several years back on those that are incarcerated in our prison system. And they looked and studied the reason, the contributing reason for why they committed crimes. And they found that over 40% of those that are incarcerated for minor crimes to that of rape and murder and some of the more heinous acts, that over 40% of them were under the influence of alcohol. It was what contributed to their decision to go out and commit those crimes. And you think of how many men and women are in our prison system today because the destructiveness of alcohol in their life. Now, we're not calling alcohol a disease or a disorder or anything of that nature. People make the decision to drink. But what I am warning and I'm highlighting here is that it is a deceptive drink and it is a very destructive drink for you personally, but then also upon your family and society in general. You could also consider the financial loss, what it costs to employ police, jails, medical facilities, therapists, counselors, all these things that have had to increase because alcoholism and alcohol addiction has increased in our society. And this has a huge financial cost, primarily upon those that are the taxpayers as we would fund these programs or fund the police force or others that would protect from those that are not controlling their alcohol consumption and thus living a disorderly and destructive lifestyle. It has also contributed to economic downfall. When people are consumed with alcohol, they allow it to dominate their life. They become unproductive in society. They sometimes will not be able to hold a job properly, or they use all that they have uh, gained for the alcohol, and now they become homeless or dependent upon other people. They're a lot more wasteful in their behavior and in the things that they've accumulated. I've personally known of people that have worked all week very hard, made a lot of money, and then on Friday and Saturday night, they use up all that money on alcohol. And they have nothing to pay their bills with, nothing to take care of their other needs with. It brings them into economic downfall. And these are just some of the problems that we see going on in our society today that are connected very clearly with alcohol. And yet... Drinking is still promoted as social, uh, uh, sociably acceptable behavior today. You say, well, how is it being promoted as acceptable behavior? Well, if you look at the media, there's advertisements there. It is always promoting alcohol. It's promoting that lifestyle. You go into any supermarket and there it is very prominent of what they're trying to sell. You go into most restaurants, there it is on the menu, it is that which is being promoted. Sports promotes it. Society in general is magnifying the lifestyle that is associated with drinking. Now they may not glorify the negative aspect of alcoholism, but they certainly will promote this, that we're to be drinking sociably. 
we're to be involved in this. If we're going to have a good time in life, then we need to have a drink in our hand. And often they do not show the reality of how it destroys a person's life. But it is being promoted in our society that to be sociably acceptable, you need to be a drinker. And there's a reason for this. And I believe the reason is brought out in 1 Timothy chapter number 6 and verse number 10, where Paul said this, that the love of money is the root of all evil. You can just do some research on your own and find out how much is made through the alcohol industry. Whether it be beer or wine or hard liquor, it is a very profitable industry around the world. Every country in the world today has a liquor market. And the Bible says that the love of money will overlook these things. Instead of addressing the dangers of alcoholism, instead of addressing the dangers of consuming alcohol, we overlook that because it's too profitable to say a negative word about. But for thousands of years, God's word has been warning people of the deceptiveness and the danger of alcohol. Now, while it is true, the Bible does not say, thou shalt not drink alcohol. I've had many discussions with people on this when they want to debate and argue the fact that alcohol is okay. Well, yes, I shouldn't go out and get drunk and shouldn't beat my wife or be involved in certain behaviors, but there's no problem with me drinking a little bit or getting drunk time to time. It's all okay. God's for it because the Bible doesn't say thou shalt not. And I would say this, that is true. There is no command in scripture where it says thou shalt not drink alcohol, but it certainly does discourage the drinking of alcohol. The Bible does not promote it, nor does it encourage it. That when we read scriptures that address this drink, it is very obvious that God is saying, watch out, stay away. This is something that is not good for your life. In fact, just listen to Proverbs chapter number 20 and verse number one. The Bible says wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Proverbs 23 and verse 10, uh, 20, be not among wine bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty and drow drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. There God is warning about the destructiveness of that drink, of how it will bring you to poverty. If you live for that drink, you engage with that drink, it will take from you, not give back. In Proverbs 31 and verse number four, it says, it is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. There is a very clear statement in Scripture that those that are in positions of leadership, those within the government, those that are leaders in society, in the workplace, in the education system, within the church, God just makes it very clear, it is not for you to drink alcohol. It clouds your judgment. It perverts your reasoning. People need you to be sober-minded. And there are many other scriptures that we'll look at today. But just in these scriptures, you come away with knowing this, that God is not saying, go out and drink. Go out, this drink is good for you. You've got problems, go drink. You want to have a good time, have a bottle. You want to increase your conversation and your, uh, your core of friends, and this is the way to do it. No, every time God says this, watch out. It is a deceptive and a destructive drink. And perhaps Proverbs 23 describes it the best. As Solomon writes 
about what alcohol will do to an individual. And I want you to listen because he not only brings out the destructiveness of this drink, but he also highlights at the end how deceptive it really is. And a lot of times we would connect it in this, that it is an addiction. And addiction would have a deceptive nature to it. I can handle my liquor. It's not going to destroy my life. I'm not going to do what that person has done. I'm not going to hit my wife, leave my family, drink up all my money. None of those things. I can do it better. And our heart and our mind is deceived. And what we find is that it quickly, it quickly takes over our life and it brings its destructive nature. So listen to what Proverbs 23 says. He starts out with a qu question. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eye shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, thou shalt say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Solomon gives a very good description of someone that is intoxicated, drunk on alcohol. And you notice that there is not one positive word that he gives. There is nothing there that would say, this is good for you. He says, who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who has contention, bickering, fighting, uh, um, strife in their life, babbling, things that don't make sense, wounds, this redness of the eyes that shows that you're under control of a substance. And he immediately identifies it. He says, those that tarry long at the wine, those that are given to drinking alcohol. Very destructive. Highlighting there the health problems that are associated with it. But you also notice that he brings out how it leads us into more sin. When we're intoxicated, thine eyes shall behold strange women. Thy heart shall utter perverse things. Becoming very vile, very perverse in our character and in our behavior and in our words. It's so destructive. And yet at the end, there's the deceitfulness. That when I awake from my drunkenness, when I get over my hangover, instead of learning the lesson and saying, that is something I never want to do again, I don't feel good, and look at the destructiveness that it has left in my path. Instead of being wise, people continue on that foolish mindset, and it says they seek it yet again. Oh, I can't wait to get off of work and start drinking again. I can't wait for Friday night or Saturday or the weekend where I can go and party and get drunk again. And there is this dependence upon something that is very destructive in their life, and they know it. But yet they keep thinking it will not utterly destroy them. Now here's the thing. You know that alcohol is not good for you. And many of you know that God does not condone the drinking of alcohol. And it doesn't matter how many times you come and say, well, Jesus, he turned water into wine. He did not turn it into alcohol. In fact, if you understand that passage where the Lord did that great miracle, first of all, the word wine comes from the Greek word of onos. And that is a generic word that can, yes, mean alcohol, but it also means grape juice. See, when grapes ferment, they turn into alcohol. 
And we don't have time to go through the entire process of that of turning wine into alcoholic beverages. But you can study that and see those things. But that is a generic word. So it's not coming out explicitly saying that Jesus turned water into alcohol in order for them to get drunk. In fact, the context of Scripture would speak against that. They had been involved in this wedding feast for a number of days. They were in their right mind. It was not an intoxicated group of people that were drunk and disorderly. Jesus would have rebuked that because he spoke out against that behavior. But instead, he engaged in that wedding ceremony and in that festive time. They ran out of drink, and the Lord, in a gracious way, in a way to demonstrate his power, turned that water into pure grape juice. And they said, this is the best that we have ever had. Somebody that is drunk has no idea what they're pouring down their throat. They are not discerning of that which is good and that which is foul. These people understood. That means they were in their right mind. They were not intoxicated. But I think this will also clarify very clearly. In James chapter number 1 and verse number 13, the Bible says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. If Jesus turned that water into alcohol, Would he not be tempting mankind to get drunk? And the Bible very clearly condemns drunkenness as a sin. No, Jesus did not turn it into alcohol. God would never tempt us to sin. He would never put something in our path that would cause us to go down the road of sin. And so even if you want to try to make that case, well, we can drink in moderation and we can do all these things. Well, really, I'll tell you this. Until you desire to be wise, you will never say no to alcohol. And that's really where it comes down to. God gives us enough warning. He doesn't have to come out and say, thou shalt not. But he does say, That if we desire to be wise, we take note of this very deceptive and uh, dangerous drink, and wisdom would teach us, don't be involved with it. See, again, as we look at the scriptures and we look at the research that we know today, wisdom would tell us that it is physically harmful. Exactly what the Bible tells us. Who hath wounds? Who hath those ailments in their body? Those that tarry long with alcohol. We know that it can be addictive. We know that from the research that is done. There are many people today that are in counseling and rehab because the alcoholic drink has controlled their life. God has said the same thing. They wake up from their drunkenness and they seek it yet again. That is a description of addiction. That is what it is. We know that it leads to sinful behavior. Those that are involved in drinking become more perverse in their thinking. They engage in risky behavior and sinful behavior. They commit crimes. We see the research. This is what the world tells us, and yet God has been telling us that for thousands of years. He said, when you get drunk, thine eyes behold strange women. What are they beholding it for? Immorality. Your heart uh, utters perverse things. Foul words. Perverse behavior is associated with it. Wisdom says stay away from it. Wisdom also tells us that alcohol brings more trouble than joy. Again, we see this in society today. And yet God has said at the end, it biteth like a serpent. But there is something far worse than those things. And that is alcohol hinders a real relationship with God. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 and verse number 9, alcohol is listed 
among one of the reasons why people do not turn to Jesus Christ for salvation. It says in chapter number 6 and verse number 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. God is saying that this drink can grab a hold of your life in such a way that it becomes your idol. It becomes your God. And it keeps you in a frame of mind and in a lifestyle that is not moving you to seek after God for salvation, but is deceiving you into believing, I don't need forgiveness and salvation. And that verse is very clear. Those that are drunkards shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It will keep people from salvation. It will also keep people out of fellowship with God. There are many today that say, well, I'm a believer. I've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. I am a Christian, but I still drink. Well, Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse 17 addresses that. The Bible says here, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. What does God want for your life? He says it in the very next verse. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Alcohol is a very controlling substance. Even the smallest amount immediately begins to control. It affects our mind, and the more that we consume, the more that it controls us. And God makes it very clear. He says, be wise about this. My will for your life is that I am always in control. You can't be chasing alcohol and walking in fellowship with God because God has condoned it. God has stood against it. And the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 5, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ is not going to be in fellowship with that type of behavior. It will also affect your ministry. Romans chapter number 13, verse 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chamberlain and wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. This is not how God wants a Christian to live their life. We're not to be involved in drinking, drunkenness, and all the things that are associated with it. We're to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, do what he's called us to do, live the life that he has called us to live, and be wise and not fools. See, alcohol has destroyed many lives. You know that as well as I do. We all know people whose lives, marriages, families, careers have been destroyed by alcohol. And maybe you've also experienced that. But what I want to encourage you in today is don't let alcohol destroy your life. Make the decision to not be drunk and disorderly. Be wise and understand this is a deceptive drink and it is a destructive drink. May the Lord bless you as you make wise decisions.